once again, it's um, always a privilege for me to be able to open the Bible every week and share uh, what I feel God has laid on my heart. And I hope that the last five weeks of our series, uh, Soul Detox, has been helpful for you. Uh, For those who are new here uh, tonight, we've been going through a series called Soul Detox, and we've really looked at the condition of our own souls and recognize that our souls is is where we, we feel and our souls is where our desires reside as well. And so the condition of our souls is so important to who we are as Christians because often we're so bound to focus on the thing that does not last forever, which is our physical bodies. And we put so much work and time and effort and resources into that and we neglect our soul, that part of us that lives on forever. And so we've looked at the restless soul, we've looked at the tortured soul, we've looked at the heavy soul, uh, when we've looked at the seduced soul as well. And so we hope that it's been very helpful for you guys. And so in concluding tonight, we're going to be examining the war that is against our very soul. Um, how many of us have seen the movie um, Saving Private Ryan? It's one of my favorite movies, so a lot of you have seen it as well. And I think it was one of the first movies, at least uh, of my knowledge, that really showed the brutality and the violence of war. Up until that point, there were a lot of Hollywood movies uh, made uh, over the decades that really glamorized war, and it showed war as something that that you really wanted to to kind of get involved in. A lot of those actors would never, ever die in those war movies. Uh, But Saving Private Ryan, the first 20 minutes of the film really got to me. It was the first time I'd really seen sort of war in, in that aspect. There was blood and guts everywhere, and it was a scene of the Allies landing on the beaches in Normandy on that fateful day on June the 6th, 1944. And so it is definitely one of my favorite movies, um, and it really portrayed the, the brutality uh, and the violence and the destructive nature of war. When the First World War happened, uh, the war before the Second World War, obviously, um, when war broke out, a lot of young men wanted to enlist because they saw it as something very... Uh, patriotic to do. Fighting for one's own country was probably the most honorable thing to do at that time. So a lot of young men were enlisting and wanted to to go fight for their country. But as they got involved and entrenched more and more into the war, they realized that it was nothing but glamorous. As they were bogged down in the trenches and looking at uh, the guys around them who, who were dying because of various diseases, and as they watch the millions around them perish, they recognize that war is anything but brutal, uh, but, but glorious. We know that the last century was, was the bloodiest century that ever uh, existed in terms of actual wars. And so a lot of wars have been fought, and um, we, we tend to, to watch movies, and we're so uh, far removed from the brutalities of war. Uh, I've got a friend in Australia. Look, I know you're not supposed to really have Australian friends or friends in Australia, but it's okay, you know, we're Christians, so we can have friends in Australia, even though they are arch rivals in sports, but I've got a friend in Australia, um, he fought in the Vietnam War in the 60s, late 60s and early 70s, and some of his experiences in the war was was horrific, and some of the effects are long-lasting even today. He, he, He tells me that often he would wake up in the middle of the night and just start crawling on the floor and then hide under his bed. He's obviously still traumatized from, from the effects of war. And he's a good friend of mine, and he's the only person I know uh, who, who has fought in a war. But I'm sure a lot of you know uh, of relatives, of, of grandparents, and then other relatives who fought in wars as well. But war is brutal. When we look at the, the whole essence of war, There is one particular war that we often don't talk about or recognize even. And this war is not fought in the battlefield. This war is not fought in the trenches. This war is not fought on on our city streets. This war is fought deep down in the very depths of every single person who calls themselves followers of Jesus Christ. And this war is a war against our very souls. And so I hope, I hope this series has been helpful for you and equipped you in some way to enable you to recognize our desperate need for Jesus every single day, 
in our lives and made us aware of this war that we're fighting. And so in concluding this series, I just want to highlight a few things from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. So that's 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12. If you want to turn with me, um, it'll also be up on your screens as well. This is now Peter talking to the church, and he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, those words can be translated as, as aliens and strangers, he says, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, when, when Peter here is addressing the church, he uses these two very interesting terms. He says we are sojourners and exiles, or in other translations, aliens and strangers. There's one thing as Christians about ourselves that we don't often recognize, and that is the fact that we are resident aliens. And what do I mean by that? Scripture testifies to us that we're actually aliens and foreigners in this earth. In other words, if we call ourselves Christians, then Jesus Christ has saved us from sin and death and hell, and He's rescued us and He's called us out. But He doesn't just leave us there. He sent us right back into this world. And so our citizenship belongs to another place. Our citizenship belongs to heaven, but we are here on earth as resident aliens. And recognizing that fact has, has huge implications on who we are as Christians. So next time uh, someone talks about aliens and whether aliens exist or not, put up your hand and say, I'm an alien. And they're going to ask you, what do you mean by that? And then you can explain. See, there's a door uh, into explaining the gospel to someone. But we are resident aliens, and that is why Peter says here that we are aliens and strangers in this world. And that very fact has implications on how we live our lives. So just kind of two observations from this uh, text for tonight, that our private war that we fight as aliens in this, war, in this world was won publicly for us. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in verse 11 of our text, Paul, uh, Peter is clear that there's a war going on deep inside of us and that the war is between our very sinful nature that exists inside of us that wages war against our, our very souls. But we need to recognize a couple of things. We need to recognize, first of all, that that war has been won. And we mentioned that already, that we're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. And so that war was won for us by Jesus on the cross. And that is what Peter means when he calls us as aliens and strangers in this world, where Jesus won the victory for us on the cross, purchased us by his blood, and called us out from the world to be his, but he doesn't just leave us there. He sends us back right into the world. And so that war was won for us by Jesus on the cross. But why do we have to keep fighting if the war has been won? Why do we need to keep fighting is the big question. Well, if you, if you know uh, anything about World War II, you know that when the Allies landed on the beaches of Normandy in in June 6, 1944, it changed the whole scope of the war because it, now it meant that Germany had to fight the war on three different fronts because they were fighting already in North Africa, they were fighting on, on the eastern side of Europe, and now the Allies were creating a whole new front on the western side of Europe for them to fight. And so they knew that sooner or later they would have to surrender, and sooner or later they would have to give up and they would lose the war. But does that mean that they stopped fighting in the war? No, they didn't. They carried on fighting. The same applies to the war that Jesus won for us on our behalf as well. When Jesus died on the cross, and we examined this a few weeks ago, Satan was defeated. He was publicly put to open shame on the cross, and he was defeated. But does that mean that he stops fighting and he stops trying to fight against our very souls? No, he doesn't. He carries on fighting, even though knowing that he is a defeated enemy, a defeated foe. But from our text tonight, we know that this is not the wiles of Satan that we are fighting that is warring against our very souls. It's our very sinful nature, the passions 
of our flesh that, that we're fighting against. And, and Satan continues to fuel our flesh with, with things that are not of God. And therefore, the war continues to exist if we call ourselves Christians. But we need to be aware of the fact that our position before Christ is secure. When he died on that cross, he secured our position before God. And our position before God is, is righteous, it's redeemed, it's forgiven. But that means our disposition, the, the way we are as people, continues uh, to fail God often because we are wrestling, we are fighting this war against the very passion of our sinful desires. And so we have that wrestle going on inside of us every single day. And there's a reason why the Bible calls our flesh um, sinful natures because our fleshly desires are in fact earthly desires which pertain to this very, very life. And they are earthly desires and they're so contrary to, to the heavenly desires. And that is why as resident aliens, aliens we need to be aware of this fact that whenever we are tempted by our fleshly desires, it is so contrary to the heavenly desires from where we actually are from if we belong to Jesus Christ. And so we need to remember that every time we are tempted to kind of give in to the seduction of our, of our flesh, we need to recognize that we're actually at war. Can you imagine this, this scenario where, where young guys enlist to go to an actual war and they are in the trenches and they, they got all their gear ready and their guns are, are locked so that they're ready to, to go into the war at any moment. And then they hear the call to go into the battlefield and they walk into this war and they come running back 10 minutes later into the trenches. Imagine uh, the guy goes, I can't believe that they started shooting at me. What is going on here? They started dropping bombs. I, I never expected this. I mean, that's silly, right? Why would someone going into war actually say that? And so as Christians, we shouldn't be surprised if there is a war going on deep inside of us, a war that is trying to seduce us and draw us further away from Christ. But this war is such a reality, and we've been enlisted by Jesus Christ as Christians to fight in this very war. And therefore, we need to live from the identity of our King who very much won the war for us on the cross. And so this private war that we are fighting was won for us publicly on the cross. And now we live from that identity. When we choose Christ, we have been granted citizenship to heaven, and therefore part of our mandate is to bring heaven down to earth. And that is part of what Jesus means when he prays the famous prayer. And he says, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We are his hands and feet that bring his kingdom down on earth. And so it is won by Jesus publicly. And so we can continue to display that public victory of Jesus by the way we live our lives. So that private war that is raging inside of us, that is drawing us away from Christ was already won by him publicly. And so it needs to continue to manifest publicly as well. And that's my second point for tonight is that our private war will manifest publicly. The way that war is being fought privately in our lives will always manifest itself publicly. Because that is why, why Peter calls us resident aliens because when we abstain from the sinful nature, from our sinful desires, as a result, we're able to live lives that are honorable. And that's what he's talking about here when he says um, we're able to live honorable lives amongst the Gentiles. Because the way we live our lives publicly is so connected to what is going on privately inside our very own hearts. And in those moments when no one actually sees what's going on. And so that public manifestation is so key for us as resident aliens. But there's always a catch to this because if we're beginning to, to win this private war and display the very uh, nature of heaven, the way we live, there's always going to be opposition. And so we shouldn't be surprised by this. And that is why in our very text, uh, when Peter says that they're going to speak against us as evildoers, can you imagine? Can you imagine the fact that you are, are trying to live your life as, as, as a Christ follower and yet people are calling you evil? Scripture testifies that, um, you know, Jesus in fact says this, and he says that one day people are going to put you to death, put Christians to death, and think that they're doing God a favor. 
I mean, that's how bad it's going to get. That's how bad it got for the disciples. And maybe one day that is how bad it's going to get for us as well. We know how bad it is for some of our brothers and sisters in Christ in other countries. And so they're going to call us evildoers, even though we are following Christ and winning this, this private war and manifesting itself publicly. And so prepare for that day, if, even if it's um, not here yet, because some of us can't even testify. If you speak to one of our youth and young adults, they'll, they'll tell you that they're called evil. They'll tell you that if they try and live their lives uh, in a Christ-like manner, they're actually called evil and they're called wrongdoers. But we know that our reward is great. We know that our reward is great because at the very end of that passage, Peter says here that when they see your good deeds, they will glorify God, not now, on the day of visitation. In other words, on that very last day when Jesus comes and he, he brings history to a close. That's when all of those who call us evildoers will recognize that these people actually are not from here, and that is why they lived the kind of lives that they did, that these people are citizens of another place, and they were representing the king of the universe, and they will glorify uh, God on that day. And so let us not be discouraged when, when we win this private war and manifest it publicly, and people look at us and call us evildoers or wrongdoers, because even though you might not get your reward and your joy and your satisfaction from people now, on that last day, it will be made completely public, and they will glorify God because of that. We live in a world that says, you know, we, we mustn't uh, display our faith publicly. We live in a world that says you can, you can live your faith privately, do it in the comforts of your own bedroom or in your home, but don't bring that out to the streets. But for those of us who carry the hope of the world, the good news of Jesus Christ, we can't help but bring that out publicly. If we really love Jesus and Jesus begins to impress on our hearts the, the de depravity and the depth of sin in this world, there's no way that we can hold it back. There's no way that we can hold it back. But you see, it all boils down to what's happening in our hearts privately because honestly we can come uh, to church every single Sunday and we can sit and stand here and worship God and and raise up our hands and, and put on a pious nature. But God himself knows what's going on in the very depths of our own hearts. And he sees what's going on in private. And so how are we doing with, with that private war that Peter is talking about here? A war against our very souls by, by the sinful nature that, that is inside of us. Do we think we're winning the war? Or do we think we're losing are we fighting from the victory that, that Jesus won for us and fighting off that? Or do we give in every single time there is some sort of temptation to draw away? Let us never be deceived by the fact that we can do whatever we want in private as long as we publicly show uh, our faith for Christ. Because you know what that is? It's hypocrisy and it's pretentiousness. It's deception and it's religion. And when Jesus was on earth, that was the one thing that really got him riled up. This private war, if we really are to engage with it um, as followers of Jesus Christ, can be made public with those around us who are also following Jesus. Because when we do it together, when we fight together, that's when we're able to gain more and more victory when it comes to that war. But we can't do it on our own. We cannot do it on our own, and that is why God has given us our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to wage war against um, the passions of our own flesh. I um, just want to get a little bit pastoral here. Um, that's all the theological aspect of, of this passage, but I really wanted to just um, dwell a little bit on, on one of the private wars that we uh, fight as Christians. It's something that has been a plague um, against, against families, against relationships. Uh, and it's a private war that uh, the majority of it that fight this war are men, but women are not excluded from this as well. And if, if you are to be honest and if you are to engage with, with many um, Christian men out there and, and with pastors as well, 
This is a very real private war that Christian men fight uh, against or have to fight against, and this is the war against pornography. And this is something that is not often taught, but, but I hope that you see the pastoral sort of heart behind this. People always don't often want to talk about pornography, but we'll be surprised uh, how prevalent it is in our lives today. A few years ago when I spoke uh, at a high school uh, about the, the damaging effects of, of pornography, and I was just doing a bit of research with some of the grade eights uh, during lunch break, and so I chatted to them and I asked about pornography, and they all pretty much said that every single guy in the room was watching porn on a daily basis, on a daily basis. And it seemed to be such a norm that they didn't even give two hoots about it because it was so entrenched in culture. But we know some of the damaging effects of pornography and what it does to our human brain. Here's, here's a little bit of a, of a scan of what pornography actually does to the human brain because on the extreme left is, is a scan of a, a more or less normal brain. In the middle there is the scan of a brain that is addicted to, to heroin and on the extreme right is a scan of a brain that is addicted to porn. And you can see that the scan of the brain on the right doesn't look like um, the scan on the brain on the complete left. And so it's a scan of something uh, that is addicted, um, a scan of a brain that is addicted to something. And so it's no different from addiction to heroin or cocaine. And so what, what pornography does is that it creates neural parts in your mind. And so it's almost like, it's almost like this. It's almost like a mountain that has never been walked on before that is full of luscious green long grass. And if someone walks along that path uh, or walks along the mountain for the first time, it begins to create a path. And so the more people walked on that path, the more defined the path actually gets. And that's what viewing pornography on a regular basis does to your mind because it creates that avenue of pleasure in your mind that you constantly go to. And how does that affect us uh, publicly as Christians? Because we think that it, it is harmless. We think that if we're watching pornography in private, it doesn't really affect our public life, but it does. Because first of all, as men, we begin to see the women around us as just objects for our own desires. We don't see them as brothers and sisters in Christ with dignity, with value, with purpose, and with worth. That's one of the effects of pornography that, that, that creates in our mind. And, and, and we know that addiction to anything is bad. But this is a private war that so many Christian men fight on a daily basis but are so ashamed to actually bring it out in the open. But we know from the testimony of so many men following Jesus that they're actually able to conquer this with the help of others around them. They're able to win this private war so that in public, uh, they're able to, to really bring down heaven to earth. They really begin to, to live as, as resident aliens. And so that's the whole sort of the undergird of, of, of this sermon here tonight is that we are resident aliens. And so we're not supposed to do what the world does. We're not supposed to say what the wor world says. We're supposed to reflect the glory and the majesty of, of the one who won us. We're supposed to reflect the glory of, of the one who wants to, who take us, who wants to take us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us to the kingdom of light. And so there's no shame for us when we are open about our private wars because it's in those moments that we actually can gain victory and manifest um, the, the, the love and the victory that Jesus won for us publicly as well. I'm just going to play a, a short clip. It's from a, a biblical counselor, and um, he's, he's been counseling uh, people who've, who've suffer, suffered from an addiction to pornography for, for many, many years. And I believe he's got some um, really biblical, Jesus gospel-centered insight into this very private war that many people fight against. So just, just have a listen to what, what he has to say, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Thanks, man. Jesus, and only Jesus, can set you free from pornography. To understand how this is true, though, it's helpful to know why people look at pornography at all. 
figuring out why you look at pornography can be a little difficult because there are a lot of wrong understandings out there about why people do this. Some people write books and articles explaining that men look at porn because they're lonely. Wives and girlfriends often think men look at pornography because they're not attractive enough. But the Bible's answer to why people look at pornography is very different. The Bible says that the main problem of holding pornography is sinful desire or lust. People look at porn because they want things that they should not want. People crave pornography because they want to see images of other people that God has not given to them. The reason they want those images is not because there's anything wrong with what they have, but because lust always wants more. Lust is the greedy desire for something that does not belong to you. People can lust after money, power, status, or anything else. You are guilty of sexual lust when you have greedy, sinful desire for a sexual encounter with someone who is not your spouse. When you understand that you look at porn because of sinful desire, then the story of Jesus begins to explode with relevance for this problem. 2 Peter 1.4 says that Jesus has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. That passage teaches that all we need to overcome sinful desire, all we need to overcome pornography, is found in Jesus Christ as we trust in his life, death, and resurrection to pull us out of the pit of pornography. If a man believes that he looks at porn because he's lonely, he'll try to find another or a better friend. If a wife believes that her husband looks at porn because she needs to get prettier, then she'll change her hair or her makeup or her clothes. When you believe the Bible, that the root problem of porn is sinful desire, then it drives you to Jesus as your only source of help and hope. If you're watching this and you're struggling with pornography, I want you to know that I have prayed for you. I know something of the darkness and despair of the struggle you're in, and I want you to know that your life doesn't always have to be the way it is right now. Change is possible, and there is help to make the change. The Bible says, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. That is a wonderful promise. If you are a believer, then the same spirit that worked to bring Jesus back from the dead is the same spirit that's at work in you to empower you to overcome sin. My friend, you need to know for a fact that if the spirit can bring to life a man who has been dead for three days, then he can overcome your desire to look at porn. If you want this kind of change but don't know how to realize it, I can tell you for certain that there are answers out there. Right now, it's important for you to do two things. First, pray. I promise I don't mean to repeat a cliche when I say that to you. I mean to share a precious promise of God with you. The Bible says in James 4 that if you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. Your first step to receive help is to ask God for it. Confess your sin to Him. Ask Him to forgive you and believe that forgiveness is possible because of the death of Jesus on the cross for your sins. While you're praying, ask God to give you the kind of resurrection power to change and live a new life that brought back Jesus from the grave. Second, reach out for help from a wise Christian. This could be a parent, a pastor, or a friend who's willing to seek God's wisdom with you to change. Whoever you tell must know that the struggle you're in is too powerful to fight alone. Now you might think that sharing your struggle will be the hardest thing you've ever done, and that's okay. Ask Jesus to help you with that too when you pray. Jesus will give you the strength to seek help if that is what you truly desire. If I were drowning in water, 
and I told you that all I needed to do was struggle harder to save myself, you'd say I was crazy. And the same is true in your struggle with porn. You can struggle all you want, but ultimately you need help from another person. Pick up your cell phone right now. Send a text message or an email, make a call. Reach out to someone right now. There are other things you need to do as you pursue freedom from pornography, but those are two essential first steps. If you'd like to learn more about how the grace of Jesus can help you be free from porn, please consider reading the book, Finally Free, and may God bless you. I was really praying while I was preparing this sermon because, you know, often you don't just want to be preaching theological sermons. You actually really want to get pastoral and get, get very practical as well. And, and when we recognize the destructiveness of pornography, we begin to realize that, that we don't view porn just because we're lonely or we can't get a girlfriend or whatever. The very root of that is, as we've seen in the text tonight, is the war that we're fighting against, is the war that... Our sinful desires in us is waging war against our souls. You know, the stats when it comes to this is, is pretty shocking in terms of the number of guys who are addicted to porn. And the, the, the results are even more devastating in terms of how many marriages, for example, it has, it has broken up. And so this is a very real thing. And obviously there's other wars that we fight, not just the a sexual lust in terms of pornography, but there's other, other wars that we fight as well. But I just wanted to highlight one of those private wars that we fight. And let, let us never buy into the deception that whatever we do in private is okay as long as we publicly show that we love Jesus because our private war will always manifest itself publicly in some way or the other and can be destructive and deadly just like a war is. But we need to live from the identity that we are resident aliens, that the struggle that we undergo every single day has been won for us on the cross. And so our identity before God does not change as Christians. If we begin to feel that we were losing this private war, that doesn't change the love of Jesus for us. That doesn't change the fact that he's paid the price for that war already. And so we have the freedom to... To, to fight and carry on fighting because this war will carry on up until the day we die. But we have the opportunity to testify of what Jesus has done for us and the work that he continues to do inside of us so that publicly we can, we can display and manifest the victory that we win in private. And so I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit has, has compelled us and made us recognize, not just tonight, but in the last five weeks, that the condition of our very souls is very critical to who we are as Christians and the lives that we live. And so let us, let us just not focus on, on the outward part of us, our, our, our bodies that will ultimately rot one day in the grave. But let's begin to focus on our souls that actually last forever. And let us do this together. As the guy said in the video there, seek help, whatever it is, whether it's pornography or, or any other private war that we're fighting against, because all of us in this room are fighting against some war or the other that has its root cause in our sinful nature, whether it's sexual lust, whether it's greed, whether it's jealousy, envy, whatever the case may be, we're all fighting a private war. But let us do it, remembering what Christ has done for us, so that our lives may begin to manifest God's glory in our lives. And in doing that, we are literally bringing heaven down to earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to, to encounter you in different ways. And tonight, Holy Spirit, I want to pray for those who have been convicted about, about the way we live our lives privately and not just the way we display our lives publicly. Holy Spirit, you are committed to making us more and more like Jesus. And you never stop pursuing us. And so for those of us here tonight that are feeling that we're losing this private war, may we know that even though at times we, we might begin to lose this war, but 
our identity, our, our status in you never changes. We are always in relationship with you if we've put our faith in you, Lord Jesus. And, and may we recognize that as people. And may we never operate from guilt or shame, but may we operate from the joy that is of knowing you. And Lord, if, if, if there are those here tonight that are really struggling, we pray that they would have the boldness and the courage to seek for help. We pray that you enable us to recognize the immensity of the private battles that we fight and this war that we fight against our sinful and fleshly desires. And may we recognize that you've called us here on this earth as resident aliens, as people who are not from here, even though we live here, as people who are from some other place, as people who have been bought by a price, and the price that you paid on the cross for us is a price that we can never pay. And so may we live our lives in gratitude because of that, and may that drive us to continue to win our private wars so that we will begin to resemble you, Jesus, more and more and more. For that is your heart's desire for us. For that is our purpose as Christians, to resemble you more and more. And as we do that, we begin to bring heaven down to earth. We just thank you for, for all of us here in this room here tonight. And Holy Spirit, we continue to trust in the work that you will do in and through us. And may we not fight this war on our own, Lord. And we keep on saying that all the time, but often we don't. It doesn't sink into our heads, Lord. So may we recognize that we need to do this together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So we just thank you for the work that you have done in our lives and that you will do in and through us. We want to give you all the glory and the honor and the praise for who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and close the service. We're going to be singing the song, Jesus Be the Center, and that is what we want, and that's what we desire in our lives. Because if Jesus is the center, then our private war will continue to be won every single day where we can manifest His glory publicly.